recognise that a changing world requires a recognition of God's activity at every level and also a commitment to be changed both personally and socially. Whatever work we may do to change our world for the better, be it poverty alleviation, creation care, advocacy for the marginalised, seeking an end to human trafficking, we need to begin by allowing the triune God to work in us. And we need to value the small individual contributions that we make. Then to this, we can add the prayer for God's work in the structures and systems of our world and organize initiatives to bring about change that God reign calls us to. The vision of God as tr Trinity opens our hearts and minds to all of these creative possibilities and more. Welcome to Crow's Nest Uniting Church however you are worshipping with us today, here personally or via Zoom. Welcome to worship. <clears throat> My name is Bob Minton and I'm a lay preacher from Willoughby and Northbridge Uniting Church and it's a great pleasure to be with you here today and share worship with you. Crow's Jest Uniting Church stands on the traditional land of the Camaragal people. We acknowledge their custodianship of the land since time immemorial and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 29, the lectionary psalm for today, and it is responsive. So if you could read the words in yellow. Give glory and honour and power and authority to the name of the Lord, all you children of God. Worship the Lord in holy awe, bow down in overwhelming presence of our God. Listen to the presence of the Lord over the waters. Hear the majesty of the name of the Lord, its power and authority above the roar of the flood. See the panels in the temple splinter at the voice of the Lord. Lightning flashes, rip open the sky. Animals give birth before their time, and the earth trembles. A shout of glory rises to the Lord, enthroned in splendor. The Lord gives protection and blessing for life forever. Amen. And our prayer of approach, let us pray. Awesome God, your creative power, your glory and holiness are beyond our imagining. Yet you choose to reveal yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, who graciously showed us the human face of your love. He stretched our imaginations once more over the lengths that he was prepared to go to, to demonstrate and the depth of your love for us. And as if not was not enough, your breath, you breathe new and everlasting life into our very beings through the power of your spirit. Triune God, source of our lives, we worship and adore you. Amen. And our opening hymn, hymn number 150, 47, To God Be the Glory.
Let us come before God in our prayer of confession. <clears throat> Let us pray. God, creator of all the wonders which you make us up this world, forgive our failure to care for and protect the lovely land, its oceans, rivers and lakes, and the air that we breathe each day. God, bearer of our humanity in Jesus Christ, forgive us when we fail to live out Jesus' commandment to love one another as he loves us. God, giver of the Holy Spirit, to lead and to guide us into all truth. Forgive us when we betray the truth of the gospel through our lack of integrity and abuse of ethical and moral standards. God, creator, redeemer, life-giving spirit, fill us anew with your creative power that may, we may be reborn in your image, glorifying you and through who we are and what we do and say in Jesus' name. As Jesus' disciples, and in his name we pray. Amen. Hear the words of assurance. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So hear the good news. To those who believe in him are not condemned. Friends, believe in the gospel. You are loved and you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn, hymn number 341. My song is love unknown.
and then mm -hmm. bring us um, greetings. The first reading is from Romans 8, 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. By, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all of those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. The next reading is John 3, 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown, up, grown old? Can no one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? Yet you do not understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, you do not believe. How can you, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has ascended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Thank you, Anna. Let us pray. Our Lord, we pray, speaking in the calming of our minds and in the longing of our heart. Speak, our Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. Today is Trinity Sunday, a day when the Christian on the Christian calendar, when all believers throughout the world <clears throat> are encouraged to think about the nature of God, whom we love and serve. We worship one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That idea can be completely mind-bending. How can one God be equally three persons? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we can tie ourselves up in the theological knots trying to understand how that can be. What can come up in the various anal analogies to help us? But in the end, every analogy falls short of the reality of who God is. And so we never end up any nearer to the truth and perhaps sometimes even more confused. But Trinity Sunday should be easier than that. Perhaps instead of trying out how to work, trying how to work out God, his Father, Son and Holy Spirit, 
we should concentrate instead on the wonderful fact of how we experience God. I experience God as my heavenly father, loving me, holding me, guarding my life. I experience God as the son, forgiving me, praying for me, leaving an example for me to follow. I experience God as the Holy Spirit, empowering me to live for him and to live for others. At the end of the day, it is not the doctrine of the Holy Trinity that is important. What is important, I believe, is, ex is how I experience God in my life. And it is, it is that experience of God that I hold on to by faith. And it is the experience of God that I want to share with other periods, people. And as the experience of God, and they can experience God for themselves. So Trinity Sunday is, is a day not to tie ourselves up in theo theological knots, but a day to celebrate our experience of God in our everyday lives. God the lover, God the forgiver, God the empowerer. And that is something really and truly worth celebrating and worth sharing with others. The passage that we have heard Anna read for us this morning from John's Gospel is the perfect example of someone take, making exactly that transition. Nicodemus was struggling to understand the exact nature of Jesus and his relationship to God the Father. But Jesus turns the conversation into one about how Nicodemus can experience God, which I believe is far more important. So I want to talk to you about an idea prominent in many Christian churches that has caused a lot of division. What am I talking about? It's the famous verse from this morning's Gospel reading, John chapter 3, verse 3. You must be born again. It's a phrase that we have come across time and time again. You must be born again. Or, I'm a born-again Christian. It's a phrase which you probably love or hate. But what does it mean? Well, I'm afraid we've got the King James Version to blame for the phrase. Because it was the King James Version that first translated this verse, you must be born again. And since that translation, the phrase phrase has become and used in specific way by certain traditions in the Christian church. Generally, it's referred to an instantaneous moment of conversion, usually accompanied by an intense emotional experience, which is the sign of having truly accepted Christ as Saviour. For some church traditions, being born again is the mark of being a true Christian. There are Christians and there are born again Christians. It is treated by some as if it was a command from Christ. What must I do to be saved? You must be born again. There's only one problem with all this. John chapter three, verse three, doesn't say it. It doesn't say you must be born again. What Jesus does say is if someone is born, not born from above, they are not able to see the kingdom of God. And that is very different indeed. So I'd like to discourage you from seeing this passage as an imperative from Jesus to be born again in a sense that you are to make a one-off personal decision for Christ. 
that will be the root of your salvation. And instead see this passage, what it really says. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night to talk to him. Nicodemus is only mentioned in the Gospel of John. But he is a central character in the narrative. Nicodemus was a Jewish leader, a Pharisee. And he comes to Jesus here in chapter 3, having seen the miracles of Jesus, but unsure what to make of them. In chapter 7 of John's Gospel, we meet Nicodemus again. And he tells the other Jewish leaders to give Jesus a fair hearing. And we meet him again in chapter 18, when he comes with Joseph of Arimathea to collect Jesus' body for burial. It seems that John gives us the story of Nicodemus to represent those who are on the edge of the Jesus event, seeing all that he does, but are not quite able to make their minds up and don't quite make a public commitment to him. Perhaps we might say there are many people in churches across the world who are in the same position. Those who come to church, those who attend church events or Bible studies and are intrigued by Jesus, even attracted to him, but seemingly never make up their mind about him. They stay on the edges of the Christ event. They never totally commit. And what does Nicodemus say about Jesus in verse 2? Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Now there's respect here. Nicodemus calls Jesus Rabbi. He even recognised the special nature of Jesus' ministry. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And yet Jesus knows Nicodemus' heart. And he knows that respect and affection and partial relational understanding is not enough. If someone is not born from above, they are not able to see the kingdom of God. So what does Jesus mean by all this? And I think there are three things. Firstly, it's not enough to be a religious observer. Nicodemus knew the ministry of Jesus. He had, had listened to the teachings. He had seen the miracles. But according to Jesus, he had not seen the kingdom of God. We can go to as many church services as we like. We can attend many Bible studies as can be crammed into a week. We can do all that, but still not see the kingdom of God. And the reason is, I believe, quite simply, is because Christianity is not an observer event. It's a way of living. It's a way of being with God. Seeing Christian events from a human perspective is not enough. What is needed is new life, new sight, birth from above. The kingdom of God is not a phenomenon to be observed. It's a gift to be received. And that's why in verse 5, Jesus changes his answer slightly. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. First time he says, no one can see the kingdom. He now qualifies that by saying, no one can enter the kingdom except by water and spirit. So what does he mean by that? It's 
brings to me my second point. We are called to be active participants in the church. As Christians, we are called to participate actively in the life of the church. And it is that Jesus referred to when he mentions water, which of course is the water of baptism. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the family of the church. And just as each family member in a domestic home has something to offer that family unit, in the same way, each baptized believer can find their place through participating in the family of the church. That normal practice should be where we find our place weekly within the life of the church. Obviously, for the housebound and during COVID, there are specific challenges for that, which we must always address as a community. And technology has increased our ability and helped this enormously. But the normal practice is for Christian believers to play their part in the family. Church attendance should not be governed by what can I get out of it? But by the question, what do I have to offer? And there's something incredibly important about regular, if not weekly attendance, because it is encouraging us, encouraging to all when the body of believers assemble together. The greatest gift we have to offer each other is just being there to celebrate together the love of God for us as a family. And after that, of course, there are plenty of ministries, of which I'm sure Michael could encourage you, we can be actively involved in. But regular participation is worship, in worship is not so much a luxury to dip our toe in and out of, so much as a baptismal responsibility that we share for one another. Jesus is raising with Nicodemus here about what it means to be born from above. Which brings me to my third point. That we are participants in the resurrection of Jesus. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. The spirit, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But what is interesting in this passage is that Jesus' response to Nicodemus when he seems not to understand. In verse 9, Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus is a bit short with him. In verse 10, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Nicodemus was a Pharisee well learned in the scriptures. His mind should have gone immediately to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 5, which says, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord to you. I will cause the spirit to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay, lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put the spirit in you and you shall live. So this reference of being born from above is a reference to the resurrection, which is promised to us as a result of being united in Christ in his resurrection. And Jesus strengthens his teaching in verse of John's gospel, chapter three, Verse 16, <clears throat> the verse Martin Luther referred to as the gospel in a verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. It is the lifting up on the cross is the source of our salvation. It is the resurrection of Jesus it is the source of our new life. And as Paul says, 
if we are united with Christ in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. We want to reclaim this verse from those who have misinterpreted and misused it throughout history. What must I do to be saved? You must be born again. And that is not what this verse is saying. It is not the basis for creating tier one and tier two Christians. It is not saying that infant baptism needs redoing as an adult. It's not saying that we need to be baptised in the spirit as a separate conclusive event after being converted to Christ. It is not saying that a new state of being must be evidenced by speaking in tongues. It is much, much simpler than that. Unless you are born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We are not to be observers. We are to be participants. To participate in the life of the church. To participate in the resurrection of Jesus who died for us. To give our lives to God. Who fills us with his spirit. So that we might live in an intimate relationship with him. And serve him better in the world. Being born from above is a radical transformation that brings newness to how we live. And that newness of life is what we celebrate today, this Trinity Sunday. That we are sharing together in our lived experience of God, in which we participate every day of our lives and through regular worship together. And is what we share with others as we leave here today, as we go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Our next song, song of hymn 132, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
this rather chilly morning. Um, morning tea after the service in the hall, in the tea room behind me, and it's birthday Sunday, so there's cake today. So if you've had a birthday this month, please come and celebrate. Um, we'd like to say thank you. The socialists would like to thank you all for bringing such yummy food last weekend when we had our last Sunday when we had our lunch. Um, we had a, it was very successful, and I hope everyone enjoyed themselves. But thank you for bringing such great food, as usual. We have a reputation for that. And also thank you to everyone who brought goodies for the asylum seekers. Um, and a particular thanks to Margaret for organising it all as she does each year. It's um, great that we can do that. And we also had quite a few donations from the preschool too. Um, the parents there are very generous and um, there were quite a number of bags came from there, which is good to have that connection. Um, I don't think I have any other things to tell you this morning, really. Um, did you read about the music in, in the news sheet? If you've got your news sheet, did you read about the, um, the prelude this morning? Um, if not, have a little read of that. Thank you.
however we make our offerings to God. Let us pray. Generous God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you call on us to make real and sh the sharing of the gifts you have given us. Use the offerings of our hearts and our hands to your glory and the service of your realm. Amen. Jill will now bring us the prayers of the people. When I say, Holy God, in your mercy, can you respond with, hear our prayer? Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your beautiful and diverse creation, bound together in an interdependent web. We pray for the world and its peoples, for places where your world is scarred by destruction and ugliness for all who bear responsibility for the well-being of this planet. Teach us to set aside conflict and strife, that together the nations may work to bring justice and peace to the world. We think particularly of Israel and Palestine. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks that by your saving love, you have made us your children by adoption and grace. We pray for your holy Catholic Church, for the company of believers in this and other lands, for all whom you call to leadership, mission or service. Bind us together in love for you, that we may be one in heart and spirit and show your love to all the world. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for our families and friends and for all relationships that speak to us of you. We pray for all with whom our lives are bound, for all those on whom we depend for our daily comfort, for all with whom we live and work, learn and play. We think of those in our congregation who need support at this time. Unite us in a community of love and care that all your people may live together in safety, dignity, and hope. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for all who inspire us with their courage and for all who bring comfort to those in distress. We pray for all your children in need for the friendless, the despairing, and those who mourn, for all who are in pain, for the sick and for the dying. Help us to set aside selfishness, that we may share with compassion each other's troubles and griefs. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks that you offer to all who believe in you the joys of, it, of everlasting love, life. We remember all who have died in your love, your faithful people of every time and place. In life, help us to follow in the way of your saints, and in death, bring us home, that we may be held forever in your community of love, and with all the host of heaven, forever praise your glorious name. Creator, Redeemer and Spirit of grace, one God, eternal and holy. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Our final hymn, hymn number 465, Father in Heaven. Oh, uh -huh. 
benediction. Can I thank all those who have participated in worship and made our worship uh, complete today? Thank you. In the name of the Father, I send you on your way. That Father of Jesus who sends rain and sunshine to bless forth, both just and unjust, and who knows our names and numbers the hairs of our head. In the name of the Son, I bless you that Christ who loved you and gave himself for you, whose peace is your healing, whose rule is love, and whose grace will one day bring you truly home with exceeding joy. In the name of the Spirit, I assure you of good company, that Spirit who inspired Jesus, a friend in joy and pain, a counsellor in anxious times, a comforter in sorrow, and a discomforter whenever we become indifferent. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.